The following episode is brought to you by the American Urological Association. This episode comes to you from the AUA 2024 instructional course, The Changing Face of Advanced Prostate Cancer 2024. For more information on how to claim CME credit or to view faculty disclosures, please visit the AUA University at auanet.org slash university. Support for this episode has been provided by Estellas, Janssen Biotech, Inc., administered by Janssen Scientific Affairs, LLC, Lantheus Medical Imaging, Merck & Co., Inc., Novartis Pharmaceuticals Corporation, and Pfizer, Inc. My name is Judd Mal. I'm a urologist at Duke University, and uh, this is on uh, changing face of advanced prostate cancer. First off, and uh, on behalf of Dr. Um, Dr. Morgans and um, David Morris, we're real, Dr. Morris, we're really delighted to have you here. Uh, we know this is a tough time slot, and for those of you who are coming in from the exhibit hall, a little bit depressing coming through the exhibit hall and seeing him breaking it down as we're coming to this course. I know we were talking about that. Uh, we also have a special guest, uh, Dr. Larry Karsh <laughs> from Colorado is here. Larry uh, is our emeritus faculty member, and we had uh, the pleasure of working with Larry for, gosh, more than a de- maybe a decade on this course. So this course has been, you know, uh, fortunately a long uh, a long, fortunately for us, a long-standing course. I hope it's for, it's fortunate for the audience too. But this has changed a lot. I mean, when when this course started, we really didn't have that much to talk about, honestly, and it's exploded as everyone knows over the last decade. Um, I'm going to now turn the podium over to Dr. Morris, who's going to start the start the uh, didactic presentations, and uh, then I'll give my talk second, and then Dr. Morgan's will go third. Thank you for toughing it out with us for this Cinco de Mayo evening. <laughs> All right, so I've been tasked with an update on metastatic hormone sensitive or metastatic castration sensitive prostate cancer, whichever term you would prefer. And I'm, I'm here trying to admirably fill in for Dr. Karsh. This used to be his portion of the presentation. I'm uh, from Nashville, Tennessee. I'm a urologist that runs a large group there runs our advanced therapeutic center, uh, focusing on advanced prostate, bladder, and kidney cancer primarily. But I am a general urologist most of the time, um, so I usually try to use this education to help my partners help navigate this more complicated patient situation, which is unfortunately growing in frequency. So these are my current disclosures, largely related to research and consulting work. And so here's the agenda that we're going to work through today. It's really background on hormone-sensitive prostate cancer, Uh, what sort of risk stratification you need to consider to help with choosing treatments. And we'll talk about doublets and triplets. We'll talk about real world utilization and how we need to move the needle and do a better job. Um, And then we'll kind of branch out a little bit, look at oligomet hormone sensitive prostate cancer. That's a fast growing patient group, largely because of our imaging technology changes. Um, And then a little bit of a snapshots of pending trials, um, getting at kind of that last patient question that we went through you know, what's coming in a few years may be different than what we have right now. So uh, first shout out is really to Dr. Morgans, who's key to this whole idea of multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary care for these advanced cancer patients. Obviously, it's a very complicated situation and includes urology, medical oncology, uh, radiation oncology, and honestly, primary care is becoming a bigger factor as we start to notice some of the side effects of our toxicity. So it's important to keep all that in mind, along with what are the goals of the patient and the goals of their family. Uh, We're becoming much more like oncologists, which is new for many urologists, as a quality of life focused organization in urology. We do a lot of non-life threatening quality of life sort of centered care. We need to do that with with advanced cancer also. And so we have the background, which is just a little bit different application. So here's kind of our our landscape progression. Um, There's many different graphics that show kind of how this path can proceed We're focusing primarily on those top two boxes, newly diagnosed or de novo metastatic disease. Unfortunately, that's men skip for a long time, PSA check really high and have metastatic disease at diagnosis. And then primary progressive or this um, kind of recurrent prostate cancer, 
sometimes lost to follow up. Um, COVID probably put a few more men in this bucket than should have been, but as people who had treatment and then for some reason were caught before they had the option of having salvageable disease and are now progressing to metastatic disease back in our clinic. So the reason that metastatic hormone sensitive is important is unfortunately, these are men that are gonna die of prostate cancer unless they have some other horrible medical condition within the next four or five years that threatens their life. This is very likely going to be their cause of death. Um, and so there's an urgency to be intense on our therapy. This is very different than the conversation that men have heard, which is no one dies from prostate cancer. Unfortunately, framing the discussion for these de novo patients is ignore what you heard on 60 Minutes. You are the sort of person that unfortunately has a problem that we need to fix with some urgency. Um, really, this whole field in the last 10 years is about intensifying therapy up front, really building on what we thought was an adequate standard of care and making it better. Um, and then really getting around the idea of even with that data, why are we not doing better? And that's urologists, that's community urologists, it's academic urologists, it's medical oncologists. Um, we'd like to think we all have an Alicia in our backyard who's a GU medical oncologist that I can lean on for, for, for guidance. But in reality, most of our communities have medical onco oncologists in the community that are not GU focused. So prostate cancer is a small sliver of what they do. And we as urologists need to be able to help in that situation too. So it's really imperative that we don't just turn it over to medical oncology. And then kind of lastly, it, it's on the bottom there is the kind of racial disparity in the US about who's in trials and what data we have. We don't have enough information on men underrepresented in the trials for minorities, African-Americans that really have a high risk that we need to do a better job of their care. So there's a lot of word salad in terms of definitions. Um, they're all basically the same thing. If you're starting therapy and you're expected to have a response to your hormone therapy, that is a castration sensitive, hormone sensitive, hormone naive. There's a bunch of different terms depending on which guidance you use. Um, it doesn't really matter uh, because they haven't developed resistance to the androgen receptor pathway. So in that situation, whether they started ADT two or three weeks ago or two months ago, they're still responding. They're still in this hormone sensitive bucket. And so this is kind of a callback to, well, two of the men in, in the uro urologic history that have been you know, led to a Nobel prize, the Huggins was the original in terms of estrogen use for advanced prostate cancer. But Andrew Shalley was part of the development of the injectable LHRH agonists. Um, and then there's a third Nobel Prize that has to do with urology. I just don't know if anybody knows about it. A German doctor who was a cardiologist by training, the first person to do a heart catheterization. Mm -hmm. Then he was shunned and basically kicked out of cardiology, no longer able to do cardiology and then trained and then became a urologist for the remainder of his career. So urology has three Nobel Prizes kind of, or maybe two and a half. <laughs> um, but here we are for, for this, these men with hormone disease, we really just have to figure out kind of what is their risk. To know who to intensify, the first thing is picking out who are the highest risks that we have to focus on. And there's several factors you can look at, but the guidelines here, this is kind of out of the AUA on the right side, the, the shoulds and the should nots and the may, all the consider languages. I try to simplify it. You really just need to figure out where their disease is and how much of it there is. That's the simple thing for a urologist to do. It could be lymph nodes, it can be bones, it can be visceral. You need to know how many lesions there are if you're looking at bone lesions, and that's by conventional imaging. So if somebody has a PSMA PET that has six lesions, that doesn't really help you put them into a high volume, low volume definition. All of that from our historical data was on conventional imaging. And then there sh you should offer germline and, and somatic testing, and I would say in metastatic disease, you, sh you should. That's not a may offer. We need to do a better job of getting testing both for the family risk but really to direct their care. Maybe not right away with that initial. For as of right now, we don't have anything that we're gonna base a decision on, uh, but there are things that can push us towards higher intense treatment uh, based off that testing. So why is it important to kind of recognize the disease state? It's, it's prognostic in terms of how the patient is gonna do. If you are de novo, if you are a new metastatic diagnosis, those tend to be higher risk. Um, the primary progressive, as you can see on the top line here on this curve, tend to be more slowly progressive than de novo disease. So survival is going to be longer for somebody who recurs after prostatectomy or radiation than somebody who shows up with disease that's blown up at the time. Now, some other language you'll see in the trials is synchronous and metachronous. The radonks really love that. That's kind of their terminology. Um, but synchronous is basically at the time of diagnosis, you've got metastatic, metastatic lesions. Metachronous means it's showing up at a later time point. Um, and so those are pretty much 
equivalent in terms of, from our standpoint, uh, for risk adjustment. Sites of metastasis are important also. You can see this is lymph node, bone, and visceral. The visceral disease does worse. The lymph node only disease does best. So it's important to keep that in mind if you're looking at somebody who's of advanced age and it's lymph node only disease and a few lesions, they have a lot of other competing risk factors. It may not have as much urgency to maximize all their intensity. And in fact, if you're looking at ADT monotherapy, which we'll say is not a guideline best treatment, there are those of us who would still use that in certain patient populations. If you're 92 and you only have a few lymph nodes, it's not wrong to say we're judging the risk benefit and find that it's probably less toxic for us to not intensify at this time point. The visceral disease, almost universally, those guys are going to have progression in the first year or two, and you need to be very intense with them up front. So where, where did all this start? This started back when Larry and Judd started this, uh, this course, and it was like, hey, we've got this whole new set of data that says we need to do something different than just do orchiectomies and put people on injectables. And it starts back at these older trials. In fact, I have to break in. Our, for the first about four or five years, Dr. Chris Sweeney himself was, was on the faculty before he moved back to New Zealand or Australia. So that was uh, in the early days when we, that's what we had to talk about, chartered. Well, and that's, so historically it was just ADT alone. Docetaxel was for late stage disease here. And you see example of two trials, which did not move the needle much versus comparator arms like mitoxantrone, which I, I've not ever written for. And I, I would question if you've ever written for mitoxantrone one time. Okay. So it's just not a standard of care now. Uh, that was for CRPC. Um, then they said, well, let's test in this population, hormone sensitive. And lo and behold, that two month overall survival benefit at the median is all of a sudden over a year. And I still remember the publications of people were losing their mind because n no medical oncology trial has OS benefits at the median that are a year. Um, that is almost unheard of. And so that was really exciting. But it also unfortunately labels us now with this idea of high volume and low volume. Those are definitions for a trial. They are not, I mean, there are lines in the sand. There is no, you can't say these three spots are low volume. They're huge. They're three huge spots. That's a low volume patient. And here's this person who has six little spots. You can't argue with me, I think very convincingly that, that they are drastically different patients, but yet they are in a trial. So it makes it very challenging to kind of understand what we're dealing with, but there's a difference between high volume and low volume from these studies. Um, generally, overall survival is better across all groups, except the low volume really does not have as much of a benefit as the high volume. So it's, it's almost all driven by the high volume. And because of that, it's, it's left us kind of burdened with this line in the sand that we have to evaluate for patients to try to make decisions going forward. Well, chemo is great, and I tell all my patients combo is better, but nobody wants chemo if they don't have to have it. And so thankfully, we had all these trials that quickly followed that were looking at oral therapy. And uh, biosynthesis inhibitors, abiraterone, you can see here the Cougar study and Latitude and Stampede, which are in our patient population at the bottom with overall survival hazard ratios, 40% improvement in terms of survival. So there was a, a very quick shift to say, well, that the chemotherapy combinations work well, so do oral combinations with ADT. So long-term follow-up from those have, have paid out that that difference is maintained, uh, both in latitude and stampede. And there's a trade-off with any of these. It's always about the benefit and the risk. And the risk is toxicity from long-term uh, ADT exposure, toxicity from prednisone long-term. And you can see here some of the bottom things looking at hypokalemia. Uh, we still see liver enzyme abnormalities in patients on these drugs from time to time. And so it is something that you need to monitor. It's not something we set and forget and then move on quickly. So then there were a whole host of AR agents that had trials that matured. And almost all of these studies are thousands of patients. So uh, we can feel fairly confident the numbers are significant, but they're also very consistent. So this apalutamide trial, the Titan study, you can see o OS hazard ratio 0.65, almost exactly the same as abiraterone, quickly followed by two studies that were on enzalutamide. Enzymet, which was run outside the U.S., Arch is run inside the U.S. as a registrational study. And you can see, once again, these curves stay separated and are very consistent, this 30 to 40 percent survival benefit being on intensified therapy. And it's maintained, and I think the best thing for me to a patient is to be able to say, these curves now get out to where we're looking at four years, five years out on these timelines. Those were not the curves we see in CRPC studies, where things are measured in 18 months to two years. So 
that the SEER data that we worry about that shows survival at five years is only one in three men for metastatic prostate cancer. Well, it's not if you're in any of these studies, the average patient's living out over five years. We need our patients to look like these trial patients, which means we need to do a better job of using medicines. And so once again, trade-offs for AR agents, just the same as abiraterone and prednisone. You can see here, most patients do well. They're 30 to 40% who can have a grade three reaction and have to change or adjust their medication or do some other medical manipulation. And discontinuation rates for most of these products are between five and 10%. So 90% of people are able to stay on the medication. Some need dose adjustments, some need to take breaks and some need to come off. But it's nice to be able to tell a patient that on these studies, both apalutamide and enzalutamide are relatively well tolerated for the benefit that you get out to four and five years. So great, doublets are better than single agent. That's an easy argument to make to patients. The next step is, well, what about if two is good or three is three better? And so quickly they then move to, we're gonna kind of start looking at a whole host of different combinations. So down at the bottom in the darkest blue are two of the trials that have come out and been kind of a publicly available now for triplet therapy, docetaxel plus ADT plus some other agent. One's darolutamide, and then the PEACE-1 study was with abiraterone. So it's important to note that these were plus minus the addition of the oral agent. So they were built on the backbone of um, the, the docetaxel. We, we don't know the opposite. We don't know if everybody's getting an oral agent with their ADT, how much benefit is there to add docetaxel. We know that there's benefit if you're giving ADT plus docetaxel to add in some sort of oral agent. And that has made it challenging to apply. In most of our clinics, patients prefer ADT plus an oral agent versus ADT plus chemo as their backbone of treatment. Uh, but you can see the comments off to the right for almost all of these have to do with subgroup analysis, looking at high volume, low volume, or the low risk or high risk, depending on which study they use, they use different definitions. Um, but the general trend looking at, these are from the studies and you can see the studies listed on the right, looking at the, the ADT alone, that's the placebo arm of most of these studies, the older studies that were against monotherapy the median overall survival is in the 30, 35 month range. Um, and that's down to historical SEER data. As you get to the doublet agents, the docetaxel abiraterone underneath it, you're moved out to the 40 to 50 month at the median. As you get down to the triplet therapies at the bottom, there's the dosi abi and the dosi darolutamide. Um, the dosi enzalutamide is a small subset of one of the Enzymet studies that did allow concurrent treatment those are starting to get out to the 50 to 60 month at the median. So that's the average person living out over five years. Um, so the general trend seems to be that more is better with the caveats that more is also sometimes just more. And we need to be cautious that we're doing it in the right people. So the, to walk through kind of the triplet therapy trials, this is piece one with abiraterone and prednisone in hormone sensitive de novo patients. Um, and it's a more complicated study to explain because it's four arms because they also included randomization to radiotherapy or not radiotherapy. The standard of care is ADT plus docetaxel. So this is largely in, in European situations, that is the standard of care is ADT plus docetaxel when this trial was started. So they said ADT plus docetaxel, and we're gonna add in abiraterone, and then out of those subgroups, we're also gonna allow some with radiation, some without radiation. And they looked at radiographic progression and overall survival. So there was improvement in radiographic progression free survival with the kind of addition of abiraterone on top of the docetaxel plus ADT. So you're seeing standard care, standard of care plus abiraterone. So there's an improvement. Hazard ratio there is 0.5. So 50% improvement in terms of progression on imaging. And you, that's the curves are out to four to five years. There was also improved OS in the de novo overall populations there on the right, uh, on the left side, sorry, overall population on the right, you see the standard of care plus Abby on top of the standard of care without Abby groups. And it is, it, there's still mixed in this is there are some patients with radiotherapy and some without. And we'll get to that in a little bit in terms of what is the, the benefit of radiotherapy in these patients. But high volume, there was a difference there, 0.72 in the, in the hazard ratio does not cross once. So that was more significant in the high volume. In the low volume patients, it, it wasn't reached because those patients are having less events. But on the other hand, there's less difference between the two arms. So it does not appear, and once again, docetaxel makes a bigger difference if you have high volume disease. More disease burden does better with cytotoxic therapy. 
So this is the Arison study. This was a combination plus or minus darolutamide on top of the standard of care. There was no radiotherapy in this. It's a much cleaner trial to try to analyze what the drug effects are. But on the right side, you can see the Kaplan-Meier curve. Darolutamide is the one on top. That's the Daro triplet versus the placebo, which is the ADT plus docetaxel. Now it's important, ODT plus docetaxel was a standard of care in the NCCN guidelines right before these studies came out. And very quickly, the NCCN updated to say, if you're giving ADT plus docetaxel, you really should consider giving abiraterone with it or darolutamide, because here's a clear improvement over the base of ADT plus docetaxel. And there are more grade three and grade four, and unfortunately, grade five events. Grade five is a death. The death rate matched between the two groups, largely driven by docetaxel, 4%. The way I view that as a, as, a, as a urologist is our medical oncologists are very good at giving chemo, especially this chemo, and getting people through it without them getting sick. Um, now, there are some toxicity changes between the two groups for those who are getting docetaxel versus not. We'll touch on those in a second. But this is not a highly toxic therapy. It's not like the, you know, adding this, this docetaxel in is largely driving a death signal in the groups. Um, it is a very manageable situation um, in most of our current medical oncology. They're very good at giving single agent chemotherapy and getting patients through it, in my experience, with very minimal problems at this disease setting. Um, so Aerosense published and had no information on high volume, low volume, or high risk, low risk, because this is all kind of after the fact analysis. So Maha presented this at ASCO last year. Um, and you can see there are bigger differences in the high volume and high risk groups than there are in the low volume, low risk groups. Um, the risk is the kind of the, the stampede definition, latitude definition, and the charted is the high volume, low volume definitions. But once again, bigger, more disease burden, triplet appears to make a bigger difference, especially the chemotherapy part. Um, it's just made it more complicated on trying to pick out who the perfect person is to give triplet versus giving doublet. Everybody should get doublet. Giving triplet is more of a nuance, picking out the people that are at high risk. And I've got some pointers on kind of maybe when we should consider that more. Um, but you can see here, this is the side effect profile of those. It doesn't really add much on top of the docetaxel other than what we've seen with darolutamide in other disease states, which we'll go through here in just a minute. But you do see things in this trial that we do not see in the other darolutamide doublet sort of studies. Neutropenia and febrile neutropenia, which we do not see with AR agents, are seen with chemotherapy. Now, I will point out that they're largely low percentages and managed very well by our medical oncologists without it leading to a fatal event. So it is something that we need to feel comfortable about that they're getting good management across the street and they're unlikely to get sick. Patients will never go to the medical oncologist willing to accept triplet therapy if I poo-poo it out of my mouth right before I send them down the hall to see her saying, well, yeah, I mean, you could get triplet, but you sh probably shouldn't. I mean, it could make you sick, but you should go see her. Mm -hmm. They walk in and they're already saying, I'm never going to get that therapy. So we almost have to over promise on how good chemotherapy is for them, for them to even consider it. And then I say, you know, hear about it directly from the horse's mouth about what you're going to do with, with chemo. But I have patients who get through it all the time. You just got to believe that you're going to do well with it. Um, but if we kind of out of the side of our mouth say, I mean, you could do that, then they'll hear that and they will go there and be unwilling to even consider it. So the AUA guidelines give the, all these options that run down through treatment. It's, it's very hard to summarize this other than to say you should be using a combination. If you're giving docetaxel, you should be giving it with abiraterone or darolutamide. So in, in my simple Tennessee terms, it's like everybody should get two things. If you're going to get three things, that's great. But you got to pick out the people who need the three things to give. Um, the first generation, like bicolutamide, flutamides, the first generation amide should only be used for flare block and not as combination therapy. Combination therapy, complete androgen blockade is cutting edge medicine from 20 years ago. It is not good enough anymore. It's not in the guidelines supported as anything we should be doing. And I do point out this, ARIs are not recommended without ADT. We'll, we'll turn it over to Judd to, to comment on what it's like to give an AR agent without ADT. There's one situation now where we actually have some data on that, but in this hormone sensitive population, they are all married together. Um, uh, and there's some other subsets where maybe that's not the case, but it, 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 at least for this subset, it's recommended if you're going to do one of these doublets, you need to have the ADT in there to make it two things. So the NCCN way of looking at that is basically laid out the same. You can see on the left circle there, it's preferred regimens. They're all category one in combination docetaxel with the other two agents added in. And then we'll talk about the thing below it, which is ADT plus radiation to the primary tumor for low metastatic burden. That's a very succinct subset of this. 
And I do point out the NCCN recommends monitoring with conventional imaging every three to six months. They do not put in there that we need to use molecular targeted imaging or PSMA PET scans. Um, the data on that is still kind of pending for what that would change about our management. So once again, back to some publications from Dr. Morgan's, all these things to consider. There's my factors, which I've already told somebody, I think you need two or three things. There's cancer related factors, which have to do with how much disease is there. Is it new? Is it recurrent? Molecular features are something that we're just now kind of delving into. But then there's the patient related factors. There's, do I have a caregiver? Can I get to the office? Do I have toxicity that might prevent me from getting chemotherapy? And we're historically bad at evaluating and managing those. We don't have a team like medical oncologists often do for a team to help support that patient related side. So if we're gonna really do this, we need to be more in tune with asking patients what their goals of, their, of care are. Um, do they have plan for end of life care? What is it that they're really looking for the trade off of living forever, but maybe being sick? Or is it really quality of life versus toxic therapy? So we kind of have to start delving into those. And then lastly is it doesn't matter how good the combination is if you can't get it to the patient. So cost out of pocket expense, which has thankfully changed and gotten better. All of those things are important that we need to pay attention to doublet versus triplet. It's, this was from ASCO publication just this past year. All those factors are kind of mentioned for push you more to doublet on the left side, you know, lower volume disease, things that are high volume disease, aggressive on the right side, push you more to triplet therapy. And there are some, uh, some items on here which are new for us, uh, some tissue markers looking at uh, tumor suppressor gene mutations and SPOP mutations. Those might help paint the picture of who needs what, but the basics are everybody needs doublet. And why do I say that it's important that everybody needs doublet? It's because if you look at what we're doing, we're historically not go doing a very good job. So I don't want everybody to focus on, we have to give A plus care or it's not worth giving. We need to just give A care. Um, looking at you know, somatic mutations that are gonna predict response is great, but that means you need to be doing it consistently that everybody's getting combination therapy first. Um, the, the adoption has just been unfortunately underwhelming. Um, from multiple data sets. Uh, historically looking back, now a lot of these trials have only come out in the last few years. They have to percolate through the community, but still most of the uh, patients in America are getting ADT monotherapy. And I think that's slowly shifting. Um, the ADT plus NHT or NSAA, which is the, the next generation uh, antiandrogens um, or next generation biosynthesis inhibitors are starting to catch up and the percentages are raising, but you can see multiple data sets here where it's still the majority of patients are still just getting ADT alone or ADT plus a first generation like bicalutamide. That unfortunately doesn't really fit the guidelines. So this kind of second caveat was the low volume metastatic disease. And you can see selected patients with low volume metastatic disease, you can consider radiation to the primary. And this is built off a couple of trial uh, data sets. Um, one of the patient questions in kind of concluded this idea of what do you do for somebody with a few lesions of metastatic disease. Stampede, as I mentioned before, uh, is a large multi-arm sort of study that's evaluating multiple outcomes and multiple therapies, but it also did include radiation to the prostate primary uh, and hormone sensitive, especially low volume and high volume. And you can see in the, the force plots on the right that the low burden uh, was favoring radiotherapy. The high burden did not really see much of a benefit. Um, and so it's kind of established radiation to the prostate if you've got low volume metastatic disease burden as a standard option. Now, there are others that it's a little, it's, the data is a little more complicated trying to figure it out. Piece one that we mentioned earlier didn't show any major difference adding radiotherapy in terms of survival benefit. Um, and then HORAD, which was an unselected group, also wasn't really convincing on whether volume was going to have an impact over uh, the outcomes of radiotherapy. But I think based off Stampede, most of us will at least consider if you can give concurrent modern dosed radiotherapy without causing toxicity that you should consider doing it. Um, any differences from the two panelists in that sort of situation? No, but I would, I mean, this is a little I, more I, controversial. All the other stuff, everybody accepts. I, now we're getting a little I, in the weeds. I was going to wait till the end, but I, one of the questions is uh, that, that we need to address is the concept of chemotherapy fit. So you have, you have a patient in front of you who truly is high volume. We know the data that trip, triplet might be is better, but um, I would just, from a practical standpoint, for the urologist in the room, um, what? Yeah, exactly. Th this issue: who 
who should we have red flags for? I mean, should we send everyone to medical oncology or are there any red flag patients where you get the consult and you say, what the, what's that urologist thinking about? I mean, why did he send this guy to me? There's no way in heck he's chemo fit. So uh, I, I love this question and I, I think that most medical on oncologists, if not all, will probably never say, why in the world did this urologist send this patient to me? Because I think we always want Except to- Except Chris Logothetis, I was with him this morning. He's pretty, he's pretty ornery. <laughs> he, he can be himself. But in any event, I, I think that we just appreciate being part of that conversation. And it's always nice to have another set of eyes. And I know, David, you do this in your practice, just kind of double checking, is everything done? Is the genetic testing done? Is the bone health discussed? It, it, you know, has all of this family history has all of this been done? It's nice to have another set of eyes. And chemo fitness is something that can actually vary day to day for some patients. And some patients may be more forthtelling with, with you or with, with a medical oncologist, you never know. And sometimes their family member comes to one appointment and not another, and they will tell on them also and say, well, actually, he sits in the armchair all day, three quarters of the day, is really not up and around. The thing that I kind of rely on and many medical oncologists rely on is this 50% up and about around during the day. So are you up and out of a chair? Are you awake? Are you functioning, moving for 50% of your day or not? Now that actually probably doesn't apply to all of us. We probably sit in our chairs way too much, but is that something you can functionally do? And that 50% benchmark is really a sort of tried and true chemo fit for medical oncologists. But then you also, of course, have to think about family supports, polypharmacy, other medical comorbidities that can make it more challenging. And you can definitely leave that to your medical oncologist to pick apart. We will never mind. But this 50% thing is something that we often rely on. So uh, it's a good point to bring up. You, there's ECOG on here and like chronopsy performance status. Like um, those are not really in the wheelhouse of urology unless you're a clinical trialist. But I mean, I think those of us, ECOG zero, like you're fully functional and working and that sort of thing. And one is basically you're retired, but you can do whatever you want around the house. And then you get into the, like, you don't have much functional status as surgeons. I view that as I can tell you who is a surgical candidate, generally eyeball test. And I feel like if I'm not scared away from operating on that person, they are definitely chemo fit. Yeah, that's that's at least my, my way of looking at them. And then my medical oncologist, they get creative. They do split dosing. They do lower dosing. They, I mean, there's ways to give chemotherapy that is not fully intense. I, I'm making you nervous sort of chemotherapy. So I, it's a great question to bring up. Like who, my answer is I send almost everybody that fits the clinical criteria and I let the expert tell them you are or are not fit. So I think that's a great way to think about it. And the multidisciplinary team is going to make that choice. And if the medical oncologist has questions, they may reach back to the urologist uh, because ultimately sometimes, sometimes you know best, but it's nice to involve them in, in the first place and let that multi-D conversation make the choice. So basically the, the data from all of the publications is we do not do a good job of intensifying as much as we should. Um, the radiotherapy is a little more complicated. This is a smaller subset of patients to find who could be eligible for radiation. Um, this is an even more controversial kind of realm, and that's metastatic direct therapy. So it's one thing to radiate the prostate if you only have a few lesions. You're debulking the tumor, and so it may help with clinical factors down the road. It could help with local voiding symptoms down the road. But this idea of met-directed therapy to kind of help is, is more challenging to measure uh, there are several trials I'll quickly go through. So STOMP was, a, these are all limited subset kind of phase two studies. It was met-directed therapy versus surveillance, and this was based on choline PET-CT, which no one in America does anymore. Um, and you can see there's, there's benefits in terms of biochemical-free survival for those getting met-directed therapy. Uh, Oriole was another kind of smaller trial, and this is co a conventional imaging, CT and bone scan, and it's SABER versus surveillance. Surveillance, once again, not a great control arm because it's just watching people with metastatic disease. We would not typically do that, but you can see SABR is superior in terms of disease control in terms of progression-free survival. Really, the better trial is this question of what do we get out of doing MET-directed therapy? Is there some meaningful endpoint? And so it's this idea in the lower box, which is eugonadal progression-free survival. That's what we want. That's time off ADT while you're not having progression of disease. And so it appears that giving MET-directed therapy and intermittent hormones with it is superior than just doing intermittent hormones. It allows people to have recovery after their radiation therapy and then be at a normal testosterone, functional for longer, 
before they have to have another round of potential therapy. So it's important to keep that. There's trials being designed, really measuring that as an outcome. And so this is the problem. We have, it's a whole word, word salad of acronyms of all these different studies that are looking at this space, which is exploding because of PSMA PET imaging. And then down at the bottom is this idea of, well, that's great for rad rat onks, but what about us as surgeons? Is there some benefit to surgery being part of this patient journey? So Dr. Chapin has a couple, they did a phase two, they have a, an ongoing SWOG study that's, that is hopefully going to give us some information that surgery may be appropriate in some of these really high risk patients. So the reason that I bring this up, we'll, we'll kind of dovetail with what's coming up from Dr. Mullen that BCR is this new disease state. Uh, BCR from the Embark study that he'll talk about is built off conventional imaging. Mm -hmm. We are in a world where many of us do not get conventional imaging. We're getting straight to PET imaging. And so we have this area that we've got PET imaging that's positive, but conventional imaging is negative. Technically, I, from, as a trialist, put those people as high-risk BCR and manage them as high-risk BCR. The reason for that is these graphs on the right, which is basically progression and survival for biochemical recurrence patients. Um, there is, you know, there's definitely survival problems if you have a BCR, but look at these curves, five years, 10 years, 15 years. There are a lot of patients who do not have high volume, high risk disease are still alive as you get to 10 years. So that, that, that does not mean we need to put people on lifetime combination therapy because they have a few lesions on a PSMA mm -hmm. PET. Um, so we just need to be very cognizant of these tools are powerful, but they're also very strong in terms of toxicity and cost. So we just need to be judicious in terms of the appropriate uh, patients. The, the patient testing is, is kind of new for urology. Germline has been around for a little bit longer than somatic, but now we're, we have targeted therapies that are available. If not this line, then coming afterwards. So almost all the guidelines support somatic testing if you're metastatic, uh, germline testing for sure if you're high volume, high risk not even metastatic, but certainly when you get to metastatic. And that can be for future PARP inhibitors, but it can be for other therapies. There's other therapies that are based off these targeted uh, mutations. And we're starting to recognize that that may put people in certain triplet categories by having superiorly high risk. And then I, I can't get out of it. Well, go ahead. Before you go on, can you, uh, uh, I remember I said that one of our pre-test questions was tricky because I think you help, you actually help correct that question as it was related to about somatic versus so germline. If you do, so if someone has metastatic disease and you do a somatic test as your first test and the somatic test comes back saying BRCA2, that is very important for that patient. Down the road, it may impact choices for that patient, but it is not sufficient to stop with that somatic mutation because if that is a germline mutation that is being caught on a somatic test, there's a whole host of implications for not only that patient, but their family. So if you see some, if you are in the realm of, somatic testing first and if it's normal then we usually don't need germline but if you get somatic testing and it's positive you need a confirmatory test because if you don't confirm if it's germline or not you could be setting yourself up for unfortunate consequences down the road if a family member then finds out they have breast cancer and they're BRCA positive and here you had this index lesion where you never got it tested to see if they were germline so if you find anything on somatic testing that's potentially actionable from a germline standpoint you need to have confirmatory germline testing. And a lot of companies, you do them side by side, so it doesn't matter. You get a test back that says whether it's germline or somatic. But just important to keep in mind that BRCA2 on somatic is not enough to then move on and start doing whatever it is you're going to do. And, and just to be very, so again, just to be very uh, clear, what, what somatic t testing do you do? I'd love to hear both of your comments on, okay, the guy walks into your office, you know, the PSA 145, bone mats, you know what he is, and we're told how to do this, what do you do? So I'll swing and then let the expert tell us. But the, uh, I, I get somatic testing on the prostate biopsy that confirmed that they had prostate cancer. It's relatively fresh, it's not archival, that's five or 10 years old. If they had a prostatectomy and they recur very quickly and have high like metastatic disease and it's recent, I will send somatic testing. And I send them paired with germline at the same time because it's generally the same company, cheap, and they're not having two out of pockets, and then I can just be done with it. Okay. Uh, but somatic testing gives you a better hit rate than germline in general, uh, at least from my experience. And you will not catch the total percentage of mutations if you just do germline testing. To get to the number that they say you're supposed to be at, which is 20% or 15 to 20%, you have to do both. If you just do germline and say, oh, they're all germline negative, 
you are missing somatic mutations. And that matters for that patient. It may not matter for their family, but it matters for that patient. And if you do somatic first and don't find any mutations, it's very unlikely they have a germline mutation and you can forego germline testing. But that's my kind of plan. So I, I think, um, I agree. I think you can do somatic testing off of the prostatectomy. You could do it off of a prostate biopsy if you have a patient with metastatic disease and you're both confirming metastatic disease is prostate cancer and you're getting biopsy of a metastatic site, you can send it from there. It can be lower yield if you're sending it from bone. Um, but tissue testing for somatic te testing is always kind of considered that gold standard, so really what we would like to do. There are multiple companies that do this, but the, this is not Prolaris or Decipher. This is somatic next generation sequencing, so this is a different test than that. I do have a lot of patients that come in and say, oh, I had, you know, there, and there's nothing wrong. There are absolutely reasons to get a Prolaris or a Decipher, or all of these tests, but these are not somatic next generation sequencing tests. So, and patients often get confused, so it's important to do true NGS testing. Um, for, when it comes to germline, though, I actually advocate for both germline and somatic, because you can miss mutations on somatic testing and you will find them potentially on germline. But that's in a setting where, I mean, I'm a medical oncologist, I'm very focused on this and many of my patients have metastatic disease and so do need to have both of those. But when you're talking to patients with localized disease and you're in a urology clinic, this is kind of a different environment and so you, we all need to set up workflows that work for us and that is the highest yield strategy, especially if you're in a setting where you have fewer resources to do large scale genetic testing. I'll try to Hurry through. I'm, I'm, you gave me too big a topic, so I'm, I'm trying to hurry to get through all this before I can. <laughs> so in addition to all the things like oligometastatic, met-directed therapy, there's this idea of, look, there's other health that we have to maintain and manage. Bone health is very important. Now, there's a lot of things that we can use. The easy things are calcium and vitamin D. You can do FRAC scores. You can get bone density scans. Um, we're generally poor at doing a lot of these things other than the basics. Uh, but if someone has osteopenia or certainly osteoporosis, we need to be looking at something on top of that. Uh, denosumab as an injectable, bisphosphonates is either IV or oral are available. Now there's some nuance to the labels on who needs what. And I would argue that just because somebody has metastatic disease in their bone does not mean they automatically need bone sort of met directed therapy. All those trials to prevent bony events were done in castration resistant disease. It's not responding to hormones. All these patients that I'm talking about hormone sensitive are going to respond to their hormones for two or three years. Their bones are probably not at risk for the next two or three years other than just ADT weakening. So you don't have to jump for the biggest gun. It has more cost. It has more potential impact on the patient. I like to focus on the cancer therapy up front, not just the bone health, because otherwise they start to have competing interests financially for the patient worried about what they're going to be able to pay for. So Quickly, I'll just run through what's on the horizon. So what are we gonna be talking about next year or the year after that? Uh, there are studies now looking at um, other agents for the hormone sensitive. So we have several of the oral agents, but darolutamide in other disease indications, but not in this disease indication. This is a, a, a kind of an interesting study that includes PSMA PET, but also conventional imaging. So they have to be negative conventional imaging, but have PSMA PET lesions. So it's, it's a really small slice of that BCR patient that we're kind of labeling metastatic, but they're not really on conventional imaging. And they do a two-year treatment and then come off and follow to see how long it takes for progression. So this is an interesting study design. It's a little harder to find that, you know, that patient that fits in that narrow band. Uh, there are other things that we're looking at. I mentioned somatic testing. P10 deficiency as screened by IHC can also be found on NGS. And this is an AKT inhibitor. Uh, capivacertib added into ABI plus ADT. So this is a different triplet, um, also being studied like the other triplets that we've discussed. And this, we hope, many of these we're hoping to have readouts in the next year or two. So um, the, the BRCA mutations we mentioned, um, there's a handful of trials that are looking at those in this hormone sensitive population. So Talapro-3 is uh, talazoparib and you can see it's DDR, HRR mutations. There's 12 of them included and that's plus enzalutamide, so that's a triplet that includes a PARP inhibitor. Uh, amplitude is a triplet that includes a PARP inhibitor, once again for HR mutated patients, and you can see the list of genes there at the bottom. It's kind of the similar genes that we've seen in, in some of the other PARP indications. Uh, 
to get kind of outside or urology adjacent, you get into some of these CDK4-6, which I, she could probably teach us all about because they're used in breast cancer, um, but they're being tested in prostate cancer. Um, so a lot of these are, hey, we've got a good combination. Let's see if we can add something else to it because there's another pathway that may be driving cancer progression. So we're, we're still waiting on many of these to accrue and read out, which takes a while for these studies because thankfully the patients respond to the doublet for several years. So it does take a while to get to these. And then uh, lastly, this, this idea of radioligand therapy, which taking the world over for late stage disease is also moving up into this early presentation. And so this is a kind of elegant design looking at standard of care, which is basically an ADT plus an AR agent. Um, and they give lutetium, lutathera in one, and then they're giving the standard of care alone in the other. And if you have imaging progression, you can cross over and then get the radioligand therapy. So uh, all of these are very exciting and they just tend to move all of these approvals that are here, this is since 2010. This is Larry's slide wonderfully built out that shows you this time progression. But the problem is all of those therapies are moving earlier and earlier in the disease. Now, not everything is a home run. And there have been several here that we're kind of marking off that these are trials that were sounded promising and lo and behold, they, they did not pan out. But the, the real issue is, you know, that's great. There are a few that didn't, but you're gonna get some of these that are going to end up being a positive win and they've got different disease states active surveillance, BCR patients like the Aristep we mentioned. So this is a rapidly changing diagnosis field. And unfortunately, metastatic hormone sensitive disease is only growing because of our PSA screening changes. And then also only growing because of our imaging technology. PSMA PET is putting more people into quote that category of metastatic disease at initial diagnosis. Doublet and triplets, the way to go. Uh, intensify as best you can if they're able to tolerate it and have higher risk or higher volume disease. You should get germline testing, should get somatic testing. It may not impact them right away, but it will set them up for what is coming. And it's a marker of poor response. If you have a BRCA2 mutation, you don't have an indication to use a PARP inhibitor at this time, but those patients universally do less well than the average metastatic hormone sensitive patient. And you need to warn them and be ready to move earlier. And then the other adjuvant stuff, bone health, all of that should be part of it. Multidisciplinary is really the way to go. Clinical trials like all those listed, they never accrue if we don't include colleagues that kind of manage these in different ways. So with that, I will, I've gone way over my time for a big disease state. I'll sit down and maybe I can learn some from these guys. So thank you. Oh, and actually I have one, one question slide. So it's now um, time. So I think, I don't know if you need to rescan or not. I think for mine is, I lost my thing. Let's go past the slides. Okay, so in case you lost it, you can scan right here because I lost mine on my phone. But now I'm back. All right, so here <laughs> we go. <laughs> It's a futility study and that turned out to be negative. The other thing is, can you shed some light on circulating tumor DNA and when we, sh we should be doing that? So yes, as, as I understand, the cyclone program has been shut down um, because of that. And uh, circulating tumor DNA at this point in time is, uh, I, I think we're all really eager to see the development of um, CT DNA um, used more broadly, even in things like uh, minimal residual disease assays. But right now, CT DNA is also called a liquid biopsy. We're actually using that for somatic testing in settings where we have very, very old primary prostate tissue, where, or we have a situation where we have a patient who either for reasons of frailty or, or disinterest can't be biopsied or bone only lesion. So CT DNA is used actually quite frequently in somatic testing now. But maybe just one quick, do you want to do your polling question? and? And then we'll take the sure, question from the mic. Question. So um, just to kind of summarize kind of all those things uh, that we just went over, uh, it's a, a man who presents to clinic after being lost to follow-up due to COVID. He had a previous surgery for a high risk, um, four plus four Gleason, and then had salvage for a PSA recurrence a year later. He's then been lost for several years and presents with a PSA of 36, has a PET image uptake in two abdominal nodes, so it's outside the pelvis, and one small liver lesion. So he's got three lesions, truly metastatic disease. Which of the following is not an ideal option for this patient? A starting combination ADT plus NHT. Uh, addition of radiation to the metastatic lesions with planned ADT plus NHT. 
starting triplet combination ADT plus docetaxel plus abiraterone, and lastly, start ADT with a first-generation antiandrogen for flare block. So this is a test to see if I did my job correctly. Okay. Thank you. And yes, most people have to think those are actually probably two correct questions, or two correct answers, but I would say the liver lesion does provide some pause, um, but there, are, there is data, if, depending on which expert you ask, that that still fits as oligometastatic disease and should be considered, uh, but certainly D is definitely fits within the guidelines of what we've just gone over. So with that, I'll exit out, and thank you all for your time. You, uh, we had a question. Yes, just a quick question regarding clinical man management of these patients. Uh, in regards to the, the border between locally advanced disease and oligometastatic, especially with like the conventional versus molecular imaging, how do you navigate that, that let's suppose, small node in the common iliac vessel, so M1A disease, only it's not enlarged, so you wouldn't show up in the, in the conventional imaging. Would you consider surgery for these ones? All of them go to radiation. Wow. And if radiation, like two to three years or with them for life. Um, so it comes up almost weekly in our multi-D tumor board, and I'm sure it does in Boston as well. So I would not, we have patients that we've taken for salvage node dissections. It's not necessarily a standard of care, but it, the really motivated patient with lesions, there's just the concern you might not find it. If it's pre-surgery and you note that nodal disease, I did that operation last week on a PSMA PET positive person with all the caveats of you're going to need possibly other things later. The guidelines, I certainly pushed him towards considering radiation, hormones, and Abby for up to two years. The, the data he's going to go over has probably changed my philosophy on that with minimal disease that's really not that big on conventional imaging. I'm doing more like what he's going to talk about with the BCR patients, and that's hitting them hard for a shorter period of time and then trying to get them eugonadal time away from therapy. And I think that's the direction our field is moving. Um, as opposed to labeling your metastatic, you're going on stuff forever. That is, I think that's the only wrong answer for that patient, honestly. Thank you very much. That was a great talk. Thank you so much. And the questions coming in are great. Um, I'm going to just focus on the Embark trial. Now, this, my talk had two modules, one on high-risk biochemical recurrence, which I'm going to cover. And because of the sake of time, there's a module, a few slides on non-metastatic castrate-resistant prostate cancer which is not new. That's the data we've known around for a long time. So I'll maybe just show the summary slide on that because we want plenty of time for Dr. Morgan's. So these are my disclosures. So what we're talking about here is high-risk biochemical recurrence, names for the same thing. Again, high-risk BCR, non-metastatic hormone sensitive, or high-risk PSA recurrence. Uh, call it what you will, but uh, we'll define this as someone who has a PSA recurrence, and based on this Embark trial that I'll talk about, who is categorized as high risk. Now, literally a year ago, this was a, a photograph that I took from the main podium. This is Neil Shore, and this was presented last year as a, as a late-breaking abstract at AUA 2023. And what's really amazing is it went from presentation at the AUA New England Journal of Medicine a couple months later in October, and boom, FDA approval 11 17, 23. What's even more interesting is that the FDA gave uh, Pfizer a broader indication than they even really expected, uh, which showed they gave it for the combo of ADT plus enzalutamide, plus surprisingly they gave it for enzalutamide monotherapy which actually, I was talking to some of the folks from the company, which actually even caught the company officials off guard because they claimed that they didn't even really ask for it. Now, whether that's really true or not. So the Embark is a longstanding study. Uh, I was the site principal investigator at Duke, and honest to God, I thought I would be retired before the results came out because we were enrolling these biochemical recurrence patients, and it takes a long time to get the results. And, it's, and it went on for about seven or eight years uh, gosh, I went through about three study coordinators till we, and it's still going on, even though it's read out, uh, it, you know, we're still following the patients uh, as if they're on trial. But 
The really objective of BARC was to evaluate enzalutamide in combination with luprolide acetate and enzalutamide monotherapy in patients with high risk biochemical recurrence. And what makes this trial so novel is that number one, it was very hard to do this trial because of the long time endpoints, it long time it takes to get the results. But we hadn't really even ever had a phase three trial except the um, TOAD trial. And now we, uh, even though I love that name, we can't really talk about it anymore because it's kind of obsolete with Embark. Three arm study, uh, basically combined therapy, just like good old fashioned combined androgen blockade with ADT. But instead of first generation, we were using enzalutamide, which is a later generation non-steroidal oral anti-androgen or luprolide alone, monotherapy with ADT or enzalutamide monotherapy. And that's, again, very novel. And the other thing that Dr. Morris just alluded to, at week 37, patients who got to a good nadir PSA, we discontinued therapy. Now, what was, for those in the room who participated in the trial, the other thing that was really interesting about it, we were all blinded to the PSAs for like seven or eight years. So these patients would come in to see us and I didn't know the PSA results. My study coordinator didn't know the PSA results and neither did the patient. So we have to really uh, compliment this cohort of patients for being willing to have faith. And I subsequently asked my patients that got enrolled, I said, did you cheat? Meaning, did they get a PSA outside the trial? And at least all my patients told me that none of them cheated and had a, had a, a secret PSA done by another doctor outside the trial. Now, whether that's really true or not, I don't know. Um, and then the primary endpoint was metastasis-free survival with uh, some of the other key secondary endpoints. These were guys who were about 70 years old, um, about, let me get the laser pointer here. So they were about 70. Of course, now the laser pointing was working great when we tested it. Now it's not working. But so you can see here about 70, uh, about a quarter of them had radical alone about a quarter of them had radiation alone, and about half of them had combo radiation and radical prostatectomy. Average PSA when they enrolled was about five, and the typical PSA doubling time was also about five months. Now patients had to have a PSA doubling time of nine months or less to get enrolled in the trial. So that was, that was the primary definition of high risk was this uh, robust or quite low PSA doubling time. Now, when the FDA approved the drug, they also got a gift because there's no specification in the FDA label with regard to PSA doubling time. So again, you as the clinician have the prerogative, you're supposed to measure PSA doubling time, but it's not actually in the label. This was the uh, key overarching results that Neil presented last year at AUA, uh, showing the uh, what was really the key message at last year's AUA is that this combination of LHRH or luprolide plus enzalutamide was better than luprolide alone. And so the thinking coming out of last year's AUA by most of us was, well, this is going to be considered by the FDA and probably or maybe they'll approve the combo therapy based on what was presented. This is just the subgroup analysis. Uh, pretty much no matter how you slice and, slice and dice the data, there was a benefit for combined therapy over luprolide, luprolide alone. And this is the interim overall survival. Again, hazard ratio of 0.59. Uh, the the uh, p-value was significant, again, for overall survival with the combo therapy versus luprolide alone. Then this was what was presented with regard to enzalutamide monotherapy versus luprolide. And there's certainly a benefit here, no question about it, but I think many of us thought that this was not quite mature enough for the FDA to approve the monotherapy, but they did. And which is good for us in our toolbox, it just gives us pause to figure out, okay, now what do we do? I mean, to think about who we're going to give combined and who we're going to give monotherapy. This is looking at patients achieving a PSA less than 0.2 at week 36. Remember, if patients achieve this endpoint, they got a drug holiday. So 
90% of the combined therapy got a drug holiday. 80, or excuse me, only 67% of the luprolide monotherapy in 85.9 or essentially 86% of the enzalutamide. Now, again, when I saw this data, you know, I was invested in the trials and site investigator, but had no clue what it was going to show. I was actually surprised that luprolide did this, did worse. I mean, we, you know, we take lupron for granted. We've all used it. It's, we've grown up with it. It's been our go-to hormone therapy, yet um, didn't look that great compared to these other two arms in biochemical recurrence. And then you look at the median duration of treatment suspension. How long did these guys get to stay off drug and improve their quality of life? Here, the combo therapy at 20.2 months uh, beat luprolide alone. And this is where the enzalutamide alone arm, uh, if you will, was, was uh, not as good, only 11.1 months. But on the other hand, enzalutamide monotherapy probably doesn't have as much toxicity as combined therapy. So, you know, you can, you can argue it different ways. The, I, I just want to focus on the key, um, the key toxicity difference and something in the trenches that we all have to be aware of. You look at the, and it's right, right down here. There we go. It's, it, the blue is a little, it's anemic there, but focus here on gynecomastia. If you look at the enzalutamide monotherapy. Yeah, over oh, here, Chad. Okay. All right, sweet, thanks. So if you look at the enzalutamide monotherapy, this is really the key thing to take home message. You have a 45% risk of gynecomastia and a 15% risk of nipple pain, uh, which is different than the combination arm and the luprolide alone arm. So one of the questions is, as we adopt this Embark trial in our practices, do we just say, well, sir, you're gonna get this, or do we do like we used to do in the old days with bicalutamide and give patients prophylactic breast irradiation? Um, and I've started to test the waters on that, and. Some patients kind of look at you like, what are you talking about? I mean, I don't want to have to go through that. But yet, for weirdly, 20 years ago when I was doing that with, um, in the Army with uh, bicalutamide, seems like it was more accepted among, the, sold among my, the retired military. They said, yeah, doc, whatever you think. But now in the private sector, at least 20 years later, there seems to be more uh, anecdotal pushback against that breast irradiation. So we'll see. Um, and then... This, these are just some of the other selected uh, side effects. But I think the key message, these arms, these three arms are fairly well balanced with adverse events, really with the exception of the breast side effects. So in conclusion on the Embark trial, in patients with high risk biochemical recurrence compared with luprolide acetate, enzalutamide combination demonstrated a statistically significant and clinically meaningful improvement in metastasis-free survival and enzalutamide monotherapy also demonstrated statistically significant clinical mean, meaningful improvements in metastasis-free survival, time to PSA progression, and time to first new neoplastic therapy. And enzalutamide combination and enzalutamide monotherapy did not really negatively affect quality of life with the exception of the gynecomastia and breast symptoms and um, there's a typo in here. Enzalutamide was FDA approved November 17, 2023, not 24, for use in uh, high-risk biochemical recurrence. Now, I'm going to stop there because I think this is really important new information and um, kind of ask uh, Dr. Morris first, uh, have you, what's been your experience in the trenches presenting this to patients and how, have you, how are you handling the the breast thing. <laughs> so uh, the breast thing, it's entertaining It's that you bring that up. Uh, so I sent a patient for prophylactic radiation and my rat aunt called me and said, why are you doing this? We don't have this problem anymore. And he's recently trained and he was like, we haven't had that problem in 20 years since yep. you used to give those other drugs. And I said, well, this is a different situation because I'm bad. getting ready to give him something that's going to be like it was 20 years ago. So your rat onks may need a little education on why they're coming back. Um, I think the, the interest in tamoxifen and other estrogen serum agents is there's going to be some new investigator initiated stuff to try to manage that because 
there's some toxicity to doing the breast radiation. Uh, Dr. Shore himself had a patient who had breast radiation and still had a problem and then couldn't have any other, anything else done because he'd already been radiated. So it's not a simple, like, as simple as we'd like it to be. Um, but I do think this patient population is there. It's just right now we're getting PET scans on most of those patients. So it's that space where PET's low volume uptake, conventional is likely to be negative. That's where I think I'm using this approach hmm. more often. Um, so they may be labeled as metastatic, but I'm treating them like this sort of patient. So um, excellent answer. Now for Dr. Morgan, so um, thinking about your, you know, the, these patients in the future that you're going to inherit from the urologist after this, um, I mean, obviously we know the old overall survival, but are there, are there oncologic considerations? Like if you get a guy who's been on long-term monotherapy versus combined therapy, I guess we have no idea what, you know, if there's any preferential treatments that we'd use after that, that we can select based on what they were on. Or do you, that, that's Yeah, a, I think, you know, I think in general, we know that we don't see a lot of effect of sequencing AR pathway inhibitors. And so I, I think we would want, probably want to switch mechanism of action. We'd probably start a GNRH agonist because, you know, if you use single agent enzalutamide or any of the AR signaling inhibitors, you're going to get very high levels of testosterone. Um, so we'll probably need to get those down because in combination with any other therapy, we typically have someone in a castrate state. Uh, I, I don't think we have perfect data to understand what the best next therapy is, but that's sort of the tried and true, that's the problem in prostate cancer. We often don't have these signaling, uh, sequencing, I should say, um, studies. And so that's something that we're going to have to, to figure out. Um, and then just to comment on tamoxifen, I think we also have to be really careful with drug-drug interactions. So. Um, GU medical oncologists who, who specialize in prostate cancer may or may not be comfortable with tamoxifen because that's really something that's been used historically in breast cancer, and there can be drug-drug interactions that could limit its use. So we have to do the, the investigator-initiated trials, but in some of the meta-analyses at least, tamoxifen may be more effective than breast irradiation. I mean, I think the key take-home message on this is I think it kind of caught us off guard with regard to the the enzalutamide monotherapy. Before I move, I'm going to show one slide on non-metastatic, and then I want to turn the podium over to Dr. Morgans. But does anybody have a question about the Embark trial before we move on? Perfect. Well, then here's here's the bottom line take-home <laughs> message. So the other disease state is this non-metastatic castrate-resistant prostate cancer, which one could also argue is not even there anymore because of PSMA PET scanning. But it really is a rising PSA on continuous ADT with a castrate testosterone level and no METs on standard imaging. There are three FDA-approved oral drugs. And again, we've already talked about enzalutamide in the Embark trial, and Dr. And, um, uh, Dr. Morris talked about the drugs in already, but apalutamide, darolutamide, and enzalutamide are all also FDA approved in that space and have been approved for the last couple years, all improved survival. These are all potent third generation oral non-steroidal antiandrogens and are generally safe and well tolerated. The key side effects are fatigue, falls, fracture, rare seizures, rash, chemical hypothyroidism, and just again for, the, for board exams or in-service exams, um, apalutamide has a higher risk of rash. I mean, most of the time it's, in my experience, it can be easily managed. It's not that difficult. Most of the time it gets better with either a drug holiday, but you, if you get a test question about rash, that's usually going to be apalutamide. You know, darolutamide does not supposedly cross the blood brain barrier to the degree that the other two do. And it's also in the trial, it was FDA approved to be used uh, in the trials, at least they allowed patients who had seizure disorders. So that's a differentiator there with regard to indication is certainly if you had a patient who had a seizure disorder or something similar, or it was at risk for a seizure disorder, you would have the option of using darolutamide, whereas you would not want to use enzalutamide or apalutamide. And there's really no, when these, none of these drugs when they were FDA approved, require any sort of extra monitoring. There's no requirements for a CBC or 
this or that. Now also hypothyroidism is sometimes seen with apalutamide, but yet when the FDA approved it, there was no uh, requirement to monitor for hypothyroidism. So what, with that uh, very quick summary, I'm gonna turn the podium over to Dr. Morgans, who's gonna cover our last topic, which is metastatic castrate resistant prostate cancer. are clearly the dedicated ones who really care about prostate cancer. So thank you so much for sticking with us. Um, we'll go through MCRPC, quite a whirlwind it has been as well. Uh, and these are my disclosures. Here's a basic outline. We'll talk about some of the basic principles for our treatment of MCRPC very briefly before we move on to some of the therapeutic advances in MCRPC, including PARP inhibitor use in isolation or as a single agent with ADT, as well as combinations with AR pathway inhibitors or with uh, guests with AR pathway inhibitors. I'll briefly mention pembrolizumab. Nothing there has changed recently, but I always hope to remind people that this is an available option for us. I'll talk about the cabazantinib and atezolizumab trial that recently read out, as well as lutetium pre and post chemo, and then we'll conclude. So quite, quite a lot to talk about here. So basic general principles uh, are that it is a complex world. This is the way that the huh. MCRPC guideline looks from uh, the NCCN right now. Obviously, this is way too much to take in on any single slide. But the point of this is that to understand where we're going to go next, we have to understand and think about where patients have been in the past. So each of these boxes is describing a patient population, what treatments they've had previously, so we can think more clearly about which treatment options they may have going forward. And I really find this sort of schematic of understanding the past to sort of anticipate future success is, is very, very important and very, very helpful. Also, the approvals depend on it. Um, so these are the other clinical things that we need to think about. These clinical factors are still key when we're choosing treatments in MCRPC. And the one I have at the top in bold is really kind of another point on that where they've been in the past really dictates where they go in the future. A novel mechanism of action is really preferred. And just to kind of get down to brass tacks on that, ARPI or AR pathway inhibitor followed by AR pathway inhibitor is generally not going to be a successful strategy. And so that's really the bottom line there. We can sometimes in 10 to 15% of patients see a PSA stabilization or maybe slight response for a brief duration of time with that second AR pathway inhibitor, but it will not be a home run for your patient. And so unless there is a compelling reason like patient frailty or some other inability to get a different mechanism of action and, and a drug option, this is not usually going to be the strategy that is going to win for your patient. We also have to think about those factors that sort of help us understand the aggressiveness of the patient's situation and where their metastatic disease is, is part of that. Are there visceral metastases in the liver, for example, where we may need something more powerful and more quick like chemotherapy? Are there bone-only metastases where we might think about something like radium-223? Uh, how is the cancer progressing? Is it symptomatic? Is it asymptomatic? This helps us to understand how aggressive we need to be in opposition to that cancer. We also, as we talked earlier, have to think about whether the patient's a candidate for chemotherapy. If that's not an option for our patient because of frailty or other issues, then we need to move on to other options. I think importantly, and sometimes we forget, we have to recognize whether this patient may de be developing small cell differentiation or neuroendocrine differentiation because this particular histology, and you need to get a biopsy and look under the microscope to actually know whether they have this histology, is really treated with a different approach. This is gonna be a platinum combination chemotherapeutic approach if the patient truly has small cell, and even for neuroendocrine differentiation, if it's a, if it's a very highly aggressive um, neuroendocrine differentiation, we may be leaning more in that chemotherapeutic direction. Um, we have to think about whether there are targetable mutations, and we'll go through PARP inhibitors and uh, pembrolizumab to think through that. And of course, we need to think about practical realities, whether we have particular treatments available in our geographic location and within our patient, um, within our clinical practice. And clinical trials are always, always important. So we've heard about genetic testing. I think 
the general sense is just from the AUA as well as from the NCCN, if you have not already done genetic testing by the time patients get to MCRPC, do the genetic testing. <laughs> Germline and somatic should be done. Um, although there are limitations in, in pathways for different practices where perhaps somatic is gonna be the highest yield and, and really reflex to germline. Um, but this is gonna be all patient populations with uh, metastatic disease, which of course includes MCRPC. So if you haven't done it before, do it again. Um, and as we heard earlier, this can be tissue-based testing. This can be a blood-based testing as well with a CTDNA option. But especially if we're thinking about neuroendocrine differentiation and or a small cell differentiation, having a, a metastatic site biopsy can be really important here and will also then give us our tissue for somatic testing. And why is this? By the time we get to MCRPC, over 20% of patients will actually have DNA repair alterations that can be potentially targeted. And with each step in the disease progression process, we see that we're really enriching for patients who have more aggressive disease, and this is going to be a population that's more likely to have a DNA repair defect in it. Um, as we also thought about earlier, the genetic alterations that are going to be most common are BRCA2 mutations, and we can see in that pie chart on the right of all patients with DNA repair defect alterations, we can see BRCA2 is making up about 44% of that in a, in a relatively recently reported study there. I think the other thing that I think about in my practice and the reason that I do both germline and somatic testing is that we actually find mutations in both of these settings and that can be really important. It, when it comes to BRCA2, which is our most common alteration, we're going to find that about half of the time in germline testing and about half of the time in somatic testing. And importantly also, we know that there's no real differential response to treatment for patients, whether they have germline or somatic um, alterations. So we can actually get responses in both of these patient populations. When it comes to other alterations that may be actually highly sensitive to treatment with PARP, PALB2, for example, that may be more commonly identified in somatic settings. Um, and when we think about MSH2 and 6 mutations, which are mutations that are traditionally considered to be Lynch syndrome mutations, but can make a patient eligible for treatment with pembrolizumab, that's going to be also more commonly identified in somatic testing. So really important that we think about doing both of these options if we have the resources to do it. PARP inhibitors have been approved now for the last few years. This initial trial, the PROFOUND trial, led to the approval of Olaparib in the MCRPC setting. And this trial enrolled patients who had uh, HRR or DNA repair defect mutations and, um, of various types, but in two different cohorts. The first cohort included patients who had BRCA1 and BRCA2 alterations or an ATM alteration. And this cohort A was really kind of the primary cohort of interest. And then cohort B included a series of other alterations that were less well characterized and understood in terms of their responsiveness to PARP. But all of these patients had had progression of disease on a prior AR pathway inhibitor and were now coming into this trial. And they could have had chemotherapy in the past, but they did not have to have it. Patients were randomized two to one to receive a laparib or that alternate AR signaling inhibitor. And the primary endpoint here was progression-free survival. And here we can see the PFS for the overall population demonstrating that treatment with a laparib in this HRR identified population, this is cohort A and cohort B all put together, the overall population, this was more effective than treatment with the alternate AR pathway inhibitor. And what I wanna draw your attention to also is that on the right side, you can see the median progression-free survival for patients with the control arm, that alternate AR pathway inhibitor, being a median PFS of 3.5 months. So basically the time at the first scan. So really just important for us to recognize that this is generally not gonna be our most effective strategy, especially in a patient population with these HRR mutations. Here we can see the overall survival reported for cohort A, which is BRCA, uh, BRCA1, BRCA2, or ATM alterations on the left, showing a, a significant improvement in overall survival in the profound study. And on the right, the overall population not quite reaching statistical significance. However, this drug is approved across all of those um, DNA repair defect mutations. So Triton 2 was a phase two study that led to the approval of Rucaparib. Also for MCRPC patients, you can see the HRR genes included in this study in that box on the left, that orange box. 
Um, but this was patients, these were patients who had MCRPC, who had DNA repair defect alterations, had had progression of disease on an AR pathway inhibitor, and also had had exposure to docetaxel chemotherapy. And they were treated in a single arm study here with rucaparib, 600 milligrams twice a day. This, uh, this, these figures actually represent patients who had BRCA1 or BRCA2 alterations uh, exclusively. And what we can see on the left is that these patients seem to have a significant resist um, measured, measurable disease decrease. Um, so this is the change from baseline in measurable disease, suggesting a really nice response by resist criteria on the left. And on the right, this is a PSA response graph showing also a really nice PSA response to treatment with single agent rucaparib. And just again to emphasize, this is only those patients in the study who have BRCA1 and BRCA2 alterations. Triton 3 was actually a study in MCRPC, which was looking um, at patients who had BRCA1, BRCA2, or ATM alterations and trying to understand in a comparative analysis if patients had had prior progression on an AR pathway inhibitor and then were randomized to treatment with rucaparib versus a control arm, could, could they actually have a, could they beat the control arm? Whereas the other study, as you saw, was a single agent or a single arm trial. The, the physician's choice control arm in this study is really interesting. So this could be the second AR pathway inhibitor, the alternative AR pathway inhibitor like we saw previously, but patients could also receive docetaxel chemotherapy. So this was the first time we actually saw an oper or have an opportunity to look at a PARP inhibitor versus docetaxel in a selected patient population with BRCA1, BRCA2, or ATM. And here we have a primary endpoint also of radiographic progression-free survival. When we look at the BRCA subgroup uh, treated with rucaparib versus the docetaxel or alternate AR pathway inhibitor control arm, we can see that clearly PFS is prolonged with treatment with rucaparib in the selected patient population. And when we look at rucaparib versus docetaxel, we also see that rucaparib beats docetaxel in this BRCA1, BRCA2, or ATM population. Again, first time that we actually saw a comparative randomized trial looking at docetaxel versus a PARP inhibitor. And what's really important is that the PARP beats docetaxel. So if we have patients with these HRR alterations and they have not yet had a PARP inhibitor and they're in the MCRPC setting, this seems like it's a more effective strategy than chemotherapy. Mm -hmm. If we look on the right, rucaparib also beats the second AR pathway inhibitor. And the median PFS here for that control arm is 4.5 months. So right around again, the first scan. When we look at BRCA on the left in terms of RPFS versus ATM on the right, what we can see is that patients receiving rucaparib when they have a BRCA mutation have a much more clear benefit over that control arm in this study versus ATM where the rucaparib and control arm basically overlap in terms of PFS. So ATM has always been a little bit of a an outlier in terms of expected response, but we don't see a clear response in this patient population with ATM during treatment with at least this PARP inhibitor. So something for us to keep in mind as we're choosing treatments for patients with ATM alterations. And here's the interim overall survival data, suggesting a trend towards benefit with treatment with rucaparib versus the control arm here, um, though this data is immature. And so we know that rucaparib and olaparib are both approved as single agents for patients with MCRPC. Rucaparib approved after progression of disease on an AR pathway inhibitor and chemotherapy, docetaxel chemotherapy, and for patients who have BRCA1 and BRCA2 alterations. Olaparib has a little bit of a broader label where patients with any of those HRR mutations can actually undergo treatment with olaparib in combination with ADT after progression on an AR pathway inhibitor, no prior exposure to docetaxel required. And PARP combinations have also been assessed. Um, these are combinations between PARP inhibitors and AR pathway inhibitors. And the thought is that there is a synergistic effect potentially between this combination of agents um, that may actually really substantially benefit our patients. So this, this study, the PROPEL study, was the first reported. This included patients with MCRPC who had had no prior treatments for MCRPC. They had had um, no prior treatment with abiraterone either. And this was an all-comers population, not a population selected for HRR mutations, which I think is interesting and important, and was based on a phase two study called Study 8, in which patients who did not have HRR mutations did seem to benefit from the combination of olaparib and abiraterone, prompting this phase three. 
So patients came into the study, were randomized to treatment with abiraterone in the first line MCRPC setting after no prior exposure to an AR pathway inhibitor in the past versus abiraterone and elaparib. And I think what we know from the PREVAIL trial is that, uh, sorry, not the PREVAIL, the Cougar 302 trial is that abiraterone as a single agent in first line MCRPC is a highly effective control arm. So essentially patients are getting abiraterone with or without elaparib and they're followed for radiographic progression here. So what we can see is the combination of elaparib and abiraterone was clearly superior when it comes to radiographic progression-free survival when compared to abiraterone alone. And again, abiraterone is a highly effective control arm in this setting. Here's the overall survival data, which is not yet mature in terms of events, but suggesting a trend toward potentially improving overall survival with the combination of abiraterone and elaparib here versus abiraterone alone. Importantly, um, and I don't think that slide, I think the slide must be hidden, but I should say very, very importantly, this benefit was much more pronounced in patients with BRCA1 and BRCA2, and that informs the label that this combination eventually had, which is now approved in patients with BRCA1 and BRCA2 in that first line MCRPC setting. Um, the combination of abiraterone and elaparib is approved. Talipro2 is also an all-comers population. This is a first-line MCRPC study as well, which included patients who entered the study um, and were randomized to treatment with talizoprib and enzalutamide versus enzalutamide as, again, a highly effective control arm in this setting. This is also, as I said, an all-comers population, though patients' DNA repair defect status was identified, was known at the beginning of the trial. And here we can see the RPFS, for the intention to treat or all comers population here, demonstrating an improvement in RPFS for talizoprib and enzalutamide in combination versus enzalutamide alone. Again, suggesting that that combination is a really highly effective um, strategy here. And this was approved also in that first line MCRPC setting for patients to receive enzalutamide and talizoprib as a combination strategy and these patients had, could have HRR mutations, all of the HRR mutations that were identified here um, and listed out in this particular study. But again, it was all comers, but approved for those patients with HRR mutations. And magnitude was a third first-line MCRPC study, which included patients who were enrolled in the, in the trial after minimal exposure to abiraterone in the first line and could have had chemotherapy previously, their HRR status was identified at the time of enrollment and they were placed into two different cohorts based on their HRR status. Cohort one included patients who had um, biomarker positive or HRR mutations and cohort two was a biomarker negative cohort. Patients here were randomized to receive abiraterone with or without niraparib, so a third PARP inhibitor. They were also followed for radiographic progression-free survival, and I would call your attention to this being the BRCA subgroup because the, the HRR mutation negative subgroup or cohort in the magnitude trial seemed to have no benefit from the combination of niraparib and abiraterone, and that cohort, HRR negative, was actually stopped for futility. So this is the, the BRCA subgroup only, demonstrating that niraparib and abiraterone had a progression-free survival advantage as compared to abiraterone alone. And again, abiraterone in this setting is a highly effective control arm, so really important benefit here. Um, and here we can see the um, RPFS. So overall survival for this population was also reported. Um, and this did seem to suggest an, an adjusted analysis and improvement in overall survival for the combination of niraparib and abiraterone versus abiraterone alone. It also improved some other secondary endpoints as we can see on the right. So this led to the approval in this setting of abiraterone and niraparib also for BRCA1, BRCA2 positive patients only. So more restricted label than telozoparib and enzalutamide and similar actually to what we saw for the PROPEL trial with elaparib and abiraterone. So pembrolizumab also has been approved for some time. And of course, this was an interesting blanket label for patients who had MSI high, high TMB, um, as well as MSH and MLH alterations, as well as PMS2 alterations that are consistent with Lynch syndrome. So I just want to call your attention. You can have these genetic alterations, not just the MSI high status or the high TMB that can also make you eligible for pembrolizumab. 
and approximately 2 to 3% of patients with MCRPC will have one of these alterations that may sensitize them, and there can be, uh, there has, have been some radiographic um, responses reported, and certainly if you talk to clinicians who see enough of these patients, they can clearly attest to this being an effective treatment um, for, for patients with prostate cancer when they have the, meet these criteria. So cabozantinib and tezolizumab have also been tested, recently reported in combination. Interestingly, both of these agents have been assessed mm -hmm. essentially as single agents and did not seem to have single agent activity. But the CONTACT-02 study in, uh, includes patients with MCRPC who have measurable disease. Um, they had progression into MCRPC and were randomized to treatment with cabozantinib and tezolizumab versus that alternate AR targeted agent. So they had to have prior exposure to an AR pathway inhibitor, had had progression, and now they're randomized to the alternate one here. There was a lot of talk when this was reported that again, we're using this control arm of an alternate AR pathway inhibitor, which we don't think is going to be necessarily highly effective. Um, so that is something to consider when we're considering this study. But at the time of the design, this was an acceptable um, control arm, and we have to view it, of course, in light of when it was designed. Um, the primary endpoint point here being PFS in that intention to treat population and OS. Uh, the baseline characteristics were relatively balanced between the arms, but again, just to remind everyone, patients could not have bone-only metastatic disease. They did have to have measurable disease, and that's, of course, because historically, cabozantinib can make bone scans actually appear to improve, even though the disease in, is not necessarily improving. So here's the progression-free survival um, by their central review and the intention to treat population, and you can see that the combination of cabozantinib and atezolizumab was superior to that second AR signaling inhibitor or pathway inhibitor, um, the median PFS being 6.3 months versus 4.2 months with a hazard ratio here of 0.65. So from a numeric perspective, in terms of months, not a huge difference, but the hazard ratio does show that there was an improvement. This seemed to be, interestingly, perhaps more pronounced among patients with liver metastases, um, showing a bigger benefit, perhaps more effective in patients with prior docetaxel, and they also reported patients who had bone metastases only. And the overall survival data is not yet mature here, but we can see hazard ratio of 0.79. This was not statistically significant. So moving on in the eight minutes we have left uh, <laughs> to think about Lutetium PSMA 617, uh, which we have also had approved for a little bit of time now. This is the VISION trial. This was a phase three study of patients who had, were relatively heavily pretreated. They had to have had progression of disease on a prior AR pathway inhibitor, as well as docetaxel chemotherapy, and they could have had additional treatments as well. And these patients are randomized two to one to receive lutetium PSMA 617 versus the best supportive care, the best standard of care, which in many cases was an alternate AR pathway inhibitor, but did not have to be. For some patients, it was a steroid. For some patients, it was a pain medication. Um, it just could not be um, chemotherapy, and it could not be radium or cipulus LT. So here we see the overall survival and radiographic progression-free survival curves with OS on the left and RPFS on the right, both demonstrating a statistically significant improvement for treatment with lutetium PSMA 617 versus that um, other control arm, whatever that best standard of care was. The overall survival advantage in months was approximately four months. Interestingly, although this was identified as being less than we wish, and certainly it was less than anyone wishes, this is actually basically the same as every other treatment that's been approved in MCRPC, which ranges in general from about two and a half months to about four and a half months in improvement in overall survival. The safety data demonstrated what we would expect, which is some cytopenias, GI effects, fatigue, and dry mouth. Um, and generally, as we said before, for many other agents, well tolerated, and that has been approved for patients who had had progression of disease on an AR pathway inhibitor, as well as docetaxel chemotherapy. Therapy also looked at uh, lutetium PSMA 617, and this was a randomized trial comparing it to cabazitaxel. And so that's why I wanted to raise your awareness of this. This is a phase two trial, so not for registration purposes, but is the comparison with cabazitaxel, which is often what we're thinking about in this patient population as a standard of care. In this study, um, PSA response was actually the primary endpoint. And here we can see that on the left, the uh, PSA change from baseline with cabazitaxel and prednisolone is listed here, 37%, was improved for patients treated with lutetium PSMA 617 at 66%. So 
this was a positive trial. Uh, but I would say that there was a similar overall survival reported for these two here. We can see overlapping survival curves. So whether we use lutetium PSMA 617 or cabazitaxel, one followed by the other, we don't have great information about which one might be better in terms of sequencing similar overall survival. We also had some data to suggest which patients may have more robust responses to treatment with lutetium PSMA 617. And I think this is going to be helpful as we try to make decisions with our patients about whether they should proceed with a radiopharmaceutical or maybe chemotherapy with cabazitaxel. Patients who had an SUV mean that was higher, particularly greater than 10, seem to have the most substantial response to lutetium PSMA 617, though generally patients who were treated overall as a cohort had superior PSA responses, as I showed you earlier, the primary endpoint as compared to cabazitaxel. But when we're thinking about this with patients, we might at some point have the ability to use their PET scan and the intensity of the lesions on the PET scan to help us understand which patients may have the most robust response to lutetium versus which may have actually a better response to cabazitaxel. And I would also say, importantly, that SUV mean is actually not a clinically reported um, number. This was a clinical trial calculated number. It can be actually a bit complex and tedious and cumbersome for our nuclear medicine colleagues to calculate. So if you want it, they may be able to give it to you for a specific particular patient, but it is not going to be something that you normally see on your reports for them. PSMA4 was also recently reported. This is patients who have chemotherapy naive, MCRPC, who have had progression of disease after an AR pathway inhibitor. Again, sort of a first line MCRPC setting, just like those three combination PARP um, and AR pathway inhibitor studies that I showed earlier. Patients who randomized one to one to receive lutetium PSMA617 versus the alternate AR pathway inhibitor. So, again, uh, um, one of these control arms that we don't expect is necessarily going to give us a, a very long um, time until next therapy. But importantly, when patients did have progression of disease on that control arm, they could cross over to receive treatment with lutetium PSMA 617. And we'll see that approximately, I think it was 84, 87% of patients crossed over and got the treatment. So here is the radiographic progression-free survival primary endpoint for this study, which suggests a benefit to treatment with lutetium PSMA 617 versus that alternate AR pathway inhibitor. Um, and those curves clearly separate with a hazard ratio of 0 0.43, favoring lutetium. Overall survival was a little bit more complex to understand. And remember that over 80% of patients actually crossed over and got the other agent. So the hazard ratio here on the intention to treat analysis on the right side of this slide was over one, which definitely raised a lot of discussion when this was reported at ESMO. Uh, a press release subsequently has suggested that it is now less than one. So we'll see what ultimately comes about when we see publications on this. Um, but that was something that was, was absolutely discussed when it first came out. Now less than one with narrower confidence intervals because more events have occurred. So in conclusion for this whirlwind of data, and I'm sorry for that, everyone, treatment of men with MCRPC really is evolving rapidly. We have numerous approvals and more options for our patients every day, but it really requires that we look for the, the options by doing genetic testing for our patients, doing PET scans in our patients, really talking to our patients about their options and what's important to them and how they want to proceed. I think especially when it comes to some of our newer combinations, things like the, the PARP inhibitors and the AR signaling inhibitors, for patients with BRCA2 mutations in particular, these are incredibly powerful combinations and they really seem to give some excellent disease control. Um, there's been a lot of conversation about missed opportunities for patients and so that falls on us as clinicians. We have to identify these mutations so that we can get these patients who really have the most aggressive disease treatments that might really change the trajectory for them. Um, I would also say that, as I said multiple times, that treatment with a second AR pathway inhibitor is generally not going to be something that we expect will be a long-term solution for our patients. So keeping in mind that switching mechanism of action is going to be, that's going to be an important strategy. We have to remember to also think about um, identifing patients for pembrolizumab, again, using genetic testing, germline and somatic. 
Um, and lutetium is an option after progression of disease on docetaxel and an AR targeted agent. That may be something that is expanded to potentially include patients who have not had chemotherapy yet. That, that remains to be seen. Um, so we'll have to see where that goes. Uh, and PARP inhib inhibitor single agents are still available as well as those combinations that have been approved in the last year for MCRPC. So thinking creatively and talking with our patients, I think will get us a long way. Thank you. So we have time for a couple questions and we've had some interesting uh, things. You know, this, this is a live stream. And uh, so I wanna, before we uh, open it up to the floor, this is actually an interesting question that came in from one of our live street audience. Um, why do African-American men have better survival in castrate-resistant prostate cancer, but not overall, when you look at the whole disease spectrum? Uh, any any uh, thoughts on that? So I think there have been studies that have looked at um, if all else is equal, if all care is delivered equally, if chemotherapy is delivered or if all treatments are delivered equally, um, there does seem to be a trend towards improved um, outcomes with for, for black men in the U.S. Um, but that really is not, not enough to offset whatever we're seeing that seems to be a mix of access issues, social determinants of health, causing people to not have the treatments that we know can be so successful. And there may be some interplay with um, disease biology that we don't understand either, but much of this seems to be driven by social determinants of health. So we can make some of our biggest differences by just getting patients the treatments that we know will be effective for them. Um, and as the, the, the person posing the question asks, perhaps they can be even more effective um, for our black patients than for anyone else. Very good. Uh Dave, you have any comments on that? I mean, I, I, she hit the nail on the head that if the trials show that they do better in certain trials, but the problem is trials are not what happened in the real world. And along those same lines, the control arm question of what's, what should be done with a control arm in a perfect world setting where everyone will accept every therapy, I think all of us would agree that docetaxel or chemo is a better comparator arm for many people who've had an AR agent. The reality is in many urology offices, we have patients that are unwilling to accept that as a potential randomization. And so I don't have a problem with those trials that give, I love the Triton trial that lets physician choice have two options because mm -hmm. some of the patients are willing to see a Medonc and get chemotherapy, many are not. And then we're excluding them and, and have almost no data that's applicable to the real world setting. So um, it is a challenging thing, but the, the reality is most of our African-American men are not treated in clinical trials and they don't have access to doublet and triplet therapy. So it doesn't matter that they do better in the clinical trials because we can't get them in to get the therapy. I think there was a question from the floor, um, Larry. No, not Larry again. <laughs> this is good. First of all, I want to uh, tell you a tremendous job team. Your uh, congratulations on maintaining the status of the best course at the AUA here. Um, uh, so you've maintained that status for us. Give I that man a drink. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's time. I, <laughs> well, I didn't really want to hijack the conversation before um, about gynecomastia, but you know, Judd, I think when we first started these, we used to have three hours. We only have two. Being on yeah. the panel, I'm sensitive to time, but you know, and just for the benefit of the audience, I know that you know this, uh, but when patients are on monotherapy with an ARI, and we learned this from Casadex, their testosterones go up. In fact, in uh, Embark, their testosterone levels were double mm -hmm. of what they were when they came into the trial. And so, um, you know, testosterone gets aromatized to estrogen, and there are men that have sensitivity to that, and that's why they get uh, gynecomastia. And uh, about half of the patients got gynecomastia in the, in the study. I mean, yeah, and uh, we were able to offer them radiation, prophylactic radiation, uh, and I did have one patient that we did, um, and it's really only 150 rads per breast, uh, and it only works 30 to 40% of the time for 
uh, preventing that. But you know, a lot of our patients, they're walking in the door, they look like they have gynecomastia. You know, some of them are obese or heavy, uh, but I tell the men that, you know, it's not like you're gonna have to wear a bra if you get gynecomastia, you may get breast tenderness. But I think rather than going to tamoxifen, like you said, Dr. Morgans, we don't wanna go down that pathway as urologists. So I think it can be offered, it may, uh, it may or may not be successful. Um, in those situations. And I know under the, back in the day with Casadex, obesity predicted a higher risk of gynecomastia, but also obesity sometimes masked the gynecomastia right. because they were, had some breast growth anyway. So it's a mixed bag. Yeah, and it's all subjective when we're talking about gynecomastia. Yeah. And you have to look at it before you start these patients on to see that they probably have baseline. Uh, breast enlargement. And I would just, I would just offer that medical oncologists do not want to delve into tamoxifen either. Not with all of the drug drug interactions that it, we're expecting. And I have some patients who are transitioning and actually like the gynecomastia. I mean, okay. obviously for different reasons. But every patient's going to be an individual when it comes to this, and whether they're bothered or not. Right. And the uh, other important thing is you have to start before you start the enzalutamide. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yes. You have to give them the prophylactic therapy with the uh, um, radiation but it's only 150 rads per breast. Thanks very much. There was a couple, uh, we're gonna wrap up here in just a minute. There's just a couple questions that came in from the live interaction that, uh, you know, two qu question about the PARPs and uh, someone asked a practical question. Okay, you got these five options. How do you make a decision when you are dealing with someone? And, and a similar question for Dr. Morris about, you know, you got all these good options for hormone sensitive and I know there's no an there's no really good answer, but just from a practical standpoint. So I would I would say if a patient has not had exposure to an AR pathway inhibitor in earlier line, I would absolutely use a combination of a PARP plus an AR pathway inhibitor in that first line MCRPC setting for patients with BRCA mutations. You know, you really you do have access to all three combinations. And I think as clinicians, we generally find that we start to use a certain agent or combination, we feel more comfortable. So whatever you as an individual feel most comfortable with, I think is reasonable because you do have to monitor CBCs. You do have to be prepared for potential blood transfusion at some point or holding the drug, which I think can be at, at, as successful, um, if not more so, as well as fatigue and some other side effects. When it comes to single agent, um, really, I think Elaparib is the one that's available. Recaparib, um, the company I don't believe is, um, I don't think so it's I, not even available yeah I, I don't I haven't tried to write it but the company went bankrupt a number of years ago mm -hmm. so I think you have access to Olaparib which is a great a great drug so, so yeah. I look just uh, before I learned something apparently how many folks are from Europe European so I I don't know I, I heard also that um, the European agency sure. actually gave a broader indication for uh, based on the Talipro right so yeah. so So, um, so the Olaparib Abiraterone has a much broader label. It's an all-comers uh, label. Um, I think that the Telazoprib Benzalutamide is still an HRR restricted label. I, I could be wrong because um, I, I don't practice there, but I do know that the um, Olaparib Abiraterone is a is an all-comers label, and that's because essentially. The, the data that I showed, and I, as I said, I'm, I apologize. I think that I have a hidden slide that shows the, the curves for the BRCA2 population, BRCA, the BRCA population. It's a much, much wider separation. However, the all comers population did seem to benefit in terms of radiographic progression free survival in the intention to treat uh, analysis. And the EMA decided not to pull out the subgroup and restrict the label. And the FDA decided that they would pull out the subgroup and restrict the label. And, and, we don't know who makes the, I mean, we know who makes the decisions. We don't know how they make the decisions at the end of the day, but we have to practice within our label. Um, so that, that, yes, that is a difference, but for the time being and probably forever, I practice here. Does anybody know what the rules currently are in Asia? Any of the Asian countries, do they have uh, is any, any uh, uh, information on that. I uh, just, just want to say I have a question oh. for Dr. Morris. I live in a country where the triplet the therapy is not covered. It's not allowed. Hmm. So we kind of try with a dose of tassel and then Sequential. after a certain period we add on. So does that 
makes sense because I, I once asked other medical oncologists and they say it, it may not, it may even be harmful in the future if you oh. use that kind of a, a strategy. I, I would, two responses to that. The Enzymet trial, which was non-US based, did allow concurrent, but also had some patients that were previously treated with docetaxel and like Arches had the same situation. So they had previously treated docetaxel and then had enzalutamide added in. But for the docetaxel pre-treated patients, there was not as much of a difference doing docetaxel and then having enzalutamide afterwards. There is probably some difference versus combination at the same time versus sequential. If you can get it paid for sequentially, the second point I would have is it does set you up to have access to other things that are, quote, post-docetaxel therapies. Radioligand therapy in the U.S. is only for post-docetaxel patients. And so if they've had it in the first line when they can tolerate it better, it allows me to have access to it l as a next line of therapy as opposed to trying to give docetaxel when someone's sicker, older, and been pretreated. So my preference in that, if I were limited in that situation, if I had a really high volume person, I would probably do them sequentially if I couldn't get them covered at oh, the same time. I, I would do what you're doing too. Oh, so you do, you do a sequential thing in the actual clinical Yes, day. ADT, dosi, let them recover, and then start the doublet therapy next. If they have high volume disease, and especially de novo metastatic, I think you're dealing with a really bad biology, and you, I would do exactly what you're doing. Well, thanks, everyone. Again, I really appreciate everyone attending, especially from the 4 to 6 p.m. on essentially the last day of the AUA. You guys all, we, we want to give you guys a uh, applause. Yes. I want to thank uh, Dr. Morris, Dr. Morgans. I just realized it's the triple M mm -hmm. faculty. So uh, anyway, hope you enjoyed it. Safe travels home. Thank you very much.